waiting for it. Now. Okay, good. Welcome. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming to the Accidental Digital Curator Town Hall. Um, anyway, there's people here in the room with me, and then we also have some people live. So this is going to be a bit strange. We have some some cameras with lights on, and so uh, we're speaking to speaking to the whole room. This is the Accidental Digital Curator is the second topic in a series of preservation town halls with lyricists that have been held due to a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and through the Division of Preservation and Access. And today's event is actually the second time we've addressed this topic. And I know that some people who are out in the, out in the um, remote attendees who also participated in the Boston event, so I, I think you'll find this one equally as fascinating. Um, just so the people in the room know, the virtual participants are, are watching this via Ustream. And what we're doing, we're recording this, and this will, the recording of this stuff will eventually be on the Lyricist Lyris Preservation YouTube channel. And I guess I should say, my name is Alex Venture. I work for Lyricist. I'm the Preservation <laughs> Services Librarian there, and I will also be moderating this event. All right. And as I said, thank you to the National Endowment Humanities for this event, and I also want to thank Rails for hosting this event. We're at the Reaching Across Illinois Library Systems Office, for those of you not in the room. And I want to thank them for their help, their technical support. They have done this without you. All right, let's get started. So if you look up the, the definition of digital curation, there are a number of ways to define, to define this concept. And part of the Wikipedia definition, and is that digital creation is the selection, preservation, maintenance, collection, and archiving of digital assets. Digital, digital curation establishes, maintains, and adds value to repositories of digital data for present and future use. Successful digital curation will mitigate digital obsolescence, keeping the information accessible for users indefinitely. We can't do that with anything, really, can we? So there you go. All, heritage, all cultural heritage organizations that are collection holders, we address the entire life cycle of the objects and collections that we have. <coughs> Excuse me. And so it's no different with the digital materials that we're bringing in. Cultural heritage institutions have been acquiring digital archives for years in some cases. Some people are just starting. They come from faculty and researchers, from authors and artists, from within your own organization and the records of others as well. Along with this digital content comes responsibility for identifying, extracting, describing, and providing access to, and providing that, providing access to this information. And today we have three speakers who will tell us about digital arch archival collections and how they're being created or curated at their institution. And I just want to share the agenda for today. Um, we have a slight variation in um, one of the speaker titles, but you guys will see that when it gets there. This is the order of events for this morning, and each speaker will have about 30 minutes, and then we'll, we'll have an opportunity for questions. You all will have an opportunity for questions. We, uh, for those of you who are participating um, virtually, we have someone monitoring the chat, so as we put questions forward, we will have those uh, read out in the room so the speakers can hear them. After the second speaker, we'll be taking a 20-minute break, and then we'll come back with the third speaker and the panel discussion. Um, so for those of you virtually, um, we take a break then. Okay. All right, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker now. And um, that will be Sam Meister. And Sam Meister is the digital archivist and, ass and assistant professor in the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Library at the University of Montana, Missoula. He's currently an instructor in the Society of American Archives Digital Archives Specialist Certificate Program. He holds a Master of Library and Information Science degree from San Jose State University, where he completed his thesis on record keeping in small nonprofit organizations. He's passionate about developing workflows, and he's going to attempt a 100 mile bike ride this summer. So cross your fingers that the weather holds so Sam can take a bike. All right. Thanks, Alex, and thanks everyone for being here. It's uh, my pleasure to be here um, and have this opportunity to talk about uh, my work uh, over the past few years at the University of Montana. Um, 
So, starting with this word iterative, so embracing the iterative. Um, iterative uh, has sort of become a little bit of a, a buzzword. Um, it's often used in the context of software development or the tech industry. Um, this idea of sort of this, this small cycle of um, building, prototyping, getting something out into the world and getting feedback on it. Um, and in my context, I'm, I'm not doing development work. I'm not a programmer, I'm not a coder. I would say I'm sort of an aspiring uh, learner of code. Um, so it's less, in this context, less about um, that and more about taking this approach and applying it to building out workflow, building out policies. Um, and so in my context, um, it's sort of focusing on um, this desired result um, and this sort of sequence, repetition of the sequence of operations. And for me, it's sort of this, this graphic, this loop, uh, starting with designing and planning, um, some amount of moving towards testing, through testing and refining that approach. So what it was starting from a certain place to the act of actually doing, changing and refining. And for me, one of the most important things is evaluation, right? So at a certain point, we need to evaluate what it is that we're doing, how has it been working actually on the ground. Um, and for me, this, this approach seems very appropriate for the work of digital archives because, well, in, in general, just working in the digital era, right? Things are rapidly changing. Technology is rapidly changing. Our um, sort of our professional uh, best practices change very quickly. The tools change very quickly. So building a, a sort of a flexible model um, in order to respond to those changes um, allows, sort of has allowed me to make progress much quicker um, than other approaches. Uh, maybe a lot of planning before actually doing something. Um, and so in this context, the feedback loop is not necessarily throwing things out to the world and getting a lot of feedback, although I definitely you know, share things with my sort of fellow colleagues around, around the country and around the world. Um, events like this as well. Um, but so so getting feedback in lots of different places, but mostly just seeing how things sort of work on the ground in, in the context in which I'm working. So starting with a little bit of context um, uh, and more related to sort of when I started doing this work, which was you know way back circa 2010, 2011. Um, and the sort of moment in the profession, um, which I call in Digital Archivist 3.0. Um, which may or may not be true, but thinking about the sort of where we had evolved from conversations around electronic records in the 90s to um, things sort of moving along with having a develop, developing a standard like the Open Archival Information System standard. And, um, and then sort of moving to a place of early sort of implementations and models. Um, the work of people like Erica and Chris had done, people like Mark Montienzo um, at Yale, um, Aaron O'Meara, sort of these early, early, early digital archivists who were building out or building policies um, and then moving towards um, skip to the Ames Project, um, which was sort of one of the first big grant-funded projects, which to me sort of their work functions as a translation from the big, this is what a digital archive looks like, to here's a framework for actually sort of moving forward in developing um, sort of institutional models, um, policies, workflows, um, and the sort of infrastructure. So in my case, it's been taking all of these things and figuring out how that's gonna work for my institutional context. And then the rise of, of digital forensics, so sort of the adoption of the methods and tools from the computer forensics industry sort of sector, which is more based on sort of criminal investigations, um, <laughs> trying to find specific pieces of evidence in digital devices, um, and how that has been adopted by the cultural heritage community to do the work of uh, sort of preserving and maintaining the authenticity and integrity of all this digital stuff that we are acquiring or that's showing up in our collections. Um, so a different kind of toolkit for doing the work, but the same kind of principles. And I'll talk about that more as I sort of get into the workflow. So for an institutional context, um, I'm at the University of Montana, um, at the University Library. 
you know, so it's a medium, sort of medium-sized um, institution. It's about 14,000 undergrad, um, a couple thousand graduate students. And the archives department where I work is five of us, right? So there's, there's me as sort of the head of the unit and then three staff members. So primarily, as digital archivists, I'm the one who's been doing all this work. <laughs> um, I'm sort of moving towards branching out. I'll talk about that later and incorporating other, other staff members. But as far as the sort of the building and the testing, um, it's mostly been um, me. So that's the library, 1974. So the starting place for me and sort of my approach is, is the starting with this sort of workflow, right? So a sort of high-level sketch of, of a workflow and the basic main phases. And again, a lot of the terminology, a lot of things that I'm using is really drawn from the Inks project and other standards and other best practices. So these aren't necessarily all my original terms. Um, but as you can see, these are, well, these are a lot of the sort of main activities of what archivists have been doing regardless of format. Um, so acquiring and accessioning, uh, arranging and describing towards access, and, and really preservation is built in throughout all of these steps um, along the way through the sort of the actions that we take. Um, so starting with a high level sketch, um, so phases, uh, and then the sort of all the maybe slightly more granular steps that make up those phases and the tasks and actions. Um, and not necessarily having all those mapped out to begin with, right? So having some sense of what, what the work, um, the individual steps, but learning sort of learning as by doing um, has really been my approach. And, and in my case, really focusing on the immediate needs, which was a lot of the material in our existing collections. Um, so when I came in, um, there is, you know, none of this existed, right? So building from scratch, um, but also sort of starting from what are, what is born digital look like for these collections? Um, and what do we already know about the different types of varieties of, of media formats, obsolete legacy media, and thinking about that as a starting place towards um, building out workflow and, and infrastructure. And so in this case, Identifying really meaning sort of like a collection survey, right? So what do we know as far as collection description of more digital materials existing in, in our, our um, collections? Uh, where do they exist? What are the formats? Getting a sense of how much and the variety as a, a starting place to start doing the work. And in, this, in that case, sort of identifying the most at-risk formats. So what I had up there was that five, five and a quarter floppy disk, right? That's very obsolete. <laughs> Uh, even having the sort of media capabilities of um, getting, getting uh, data off of those various forms of, of outdated media can be difficult. Um, so that's where stabilizing is really one of the main priorities, is moving from those, those bits, those files living on that, that old media, getting onto something more contemporary. So in my case, um, sort of you know, a network storage environment for the Florida library. Um, and preparing those materials for long-term preservation. And when I say prepare, that's sort of important. It's not, in this case, it's not having a formal preservation repository. Um, it's at least doing some actions to get those materials ready for long-term preservation, but not waiting to have something completely adopted and decided upon you know, by the entire library. And I'll talk about um, the context of that a little bit more later. So, Workflow, sort of high level sketch. I know that there are specific things that I want to do, but I'm going to need infrastructure to do that work. So, where I started from um, was trying to figure out, based on those immediate needs, based on the type of media that we had. So, we had floppy disks, we had some CD ROMs. What was the infrastructure that I was going to need to do, these, do this activity of accessioning um, those materials? So what I needed was basically some sort of setup, some sort of computer setup that I can run the sort of tools, the software, and connect the pieces of hardware um, to do that work. And so the board, the board digital workstation was born. Um, and in my case, what this is, is a machine that runs both the Windows operating system and the Linux operating system as a means, really, is sort of the exploration and testing of different pieces of, of software um, that have different operating system requirements. Um, and so this was 
sort of a conversation with our IT department to set that up. Um, the device we started with, 1.0, um, was a computer that had been used um, to process, or to process, originally process the collection that had some obsolete media. Um, so we had some legacy drives, which I, I would definitely identify as being an advantageous situation of even having these, this type of hardware laying around. Um, and the machine was a little older, a little slower through sort of initial testing, very, very soon realized that it wasn't really going to perform in the way we needed to. The basic things I was trying to do was taking a long time. Um, so we moved to a, a slimmer, newer, more high-performing model. And in this case, um, something where the different sort of drives to deal with all of these, these different forms of floppy disks uh, would plug in via USB. So this was sort of an original, very quick iteration of um, trying to move towards a machine itself that would be more flexible. That so you know that would be able to plug in different devices um, via the USB port, which is fairly standardized, and you know that could also disappear at some point, but allowed at least that initial starting place. Um, so and then sort of a, a five and a quarter drive that has this other piece, little piece of hardware that we purchased very fairly inexpensive to also plug in the USB zip drive. Um, so not that many pieces of, of, hard, of hardware um, and really reflective of what we needed to deal with right then. So not trying to plan out a huge system for all the unknowns, um, but just what we have right now. And then storage space. Um, so we're getting data off of these different media. We need to put them somewhere. Um, not a huge amount of data because they're sort of formats didn't store that much, but something, in my case, that was slightly more protected than whatever else the, sort of the library had managing, right? So we all sort of have work drives as staff members where we put our, our Word documents and whatever else we're working on. And so what I wanted to set up was something that at least had another layer of protection um, and really sort of managing who had access to that, that particular data. This was sort of high priority. We wanted, we had different copies in these sort of three different places, um, but uh, we wanted to make sure that no one was going to inadvertently delete those. That had happened in the past before my arrival, so we wanted to protect against those, those types of incidents. Um, and having multiple copies, and just in case that happened, we would be able to restore. And as far as hardware, really the main main piece of equipment that needed to be purchased um, were these write blockers. So this is kind of being the main incorporation of digital forensics type hardware into the infrastructure. Um, and if people aren't quite familiar with write blockers, all they are is devices that sort of act as a bridge between wherever you're getting the data, so if that's sort of a floppy disk or someone's computer, and sort of your workstation. So if the write blocker, very simply, prevents from writing over any of that data during the transfer process. So you're not changing any of the, the sort of things like date last modified or any of the bits in that process. Um, just ensuring, and again, sort of coming back to ensuring the, the authenticity of those objects that you're not um, causing any change through the act of, of acquiring those materials. And so hardware toward moving towards tools and software. And my approach has really been what tools match um, the function that I need to perform. And as I go through the workflow, I'll sort of outline what the different functions are um, in the workflow. And so that as a starting place, um, and then thinking that there may be more than one tool that's more more than one piece of software that is going to sort of perform the function that I need to perform. And through testing, um, I'll, I'll determine you know which which meets that function best, and also which is kind of easier to use. And um, talk a little bit more about that. And so in this case, open source tools. And I sort of want to have a little bit of a tangent on open source um, because a lot of the tools that I um, use for open source, um, and like I already mentioned, there there are issues to consider um, with any kind of tool, but particular open source. Um, that may have different types of uh, requirements that you may or may not be familiar with using, um, especially if one is an operating in sort of a Windows uh, environment most of the time. Those tools are likely to change quickly and 
uh, because they're sort of being built at the same time you're using them. Um, and the sort of interfaces that you're working with may end up being fairly simple. Sometimes even knowing where to start whatever process you're doing can be variable. Um, and the, there, there may be ongoing support that's needed from people who have maybe a higher level of expertise in dealing with systems. Um, so in my case, even using something, um, this big curator tool, um, and I'll talk more about that, moving from this sort of interface, which is command line, sort of pre graphical user interface mode, um, towards um, when they define, when they design an actual very simple user interface, but even that was sort of a step in the, a more positive user experience direction, and that happened in the course of a year. So starting from sort of an earlier version of this tool to a later version. Um, and um, so that is inherently a part of the process. Um, but the way I sort of think about the benefits, uh, for me, a lot of these, these tools are free, right? You're not paying a price just to download them or to install them. There's obviously the sort of labor costs of installing them and testing them. In my case, um, I was one of the few people sort of using these tools to allow me to sort of engage with the people in IT and have a dialogue um, and sort of get them on board um, based on mapping out these sort of basic requirements. So this is the work that I need to do. These are some tools that I need to test in order to do this work. And that's inherently a part of the work that we do as, as digital archivists, as digital librarians. It's a lot of exploring and testing. Um, and in, in this case, a lot of the tools I've been using, things like BitCurator or Mathematica, those have been designed and developed in collaboration with the professional community. So as far as what those tools do and how they perform, um, there's been a lot of sort of feedback and input into what they, they look like. And there's opportunities to continue that process. And again, it's sort of this mirror of of designing, testing, refining, and evaluating. And so it's the same sort of parallel process with how these tools end up being developed as well. Um, and so I sort of like that approach. And not saying that open source is the best, it's the only way to go, sort of coming back to the idea of here's this function, here's some tools that may do that, and it's really related to your particular context and what's going to be most appropriate. So I thought I would address this question just, just to, to sort of to get it out there. Um, and so if, if you don't have someone you can have a dialogue with, it's really just you, I think there's still opportunities in many of the tools um, that allow you to sort of download and play with them, even if it's sort of in a virtual environment, you can operate those in, in, even in a Windows operating system, um, and give you a chance to at least get a sense of how they work, um, and then um, determine if, you know, if you're sort of comfortable with them or not. So it's not that you can't at least try some of these things before coming to the ultimate decision of what is actually going to work in your context. Um, we can definitely talk more about that. So starting from building sort of sketch of workflow to having some amount of tools and infrastructure to very quickly doing the work. So in my, my case, really focusing on, again, sort of our existing collections. Um, what do we already have? How do we stabilize the materials um, as a means of testing the workflow, as a means of sort of coming up with um, the approaches that we're going to work, um, and then refining and evaluating along the way. So at this point, I'm just going to sort of map out sort of the different steps and tasks um, that, that I've been working on with this workflow, and then highlight some of the issues that have come up. So it's not going to be totally comprehensive, but sort of what happens doing while doing the work. Um, and so for acquisition being that, that sort of the moment of getting the digital stuff from wherever it comes from, individuals, organizations, into your institution, and sort of that process of um, uh, mapping and, and, and transferring um, the data, and in this case sort of the, the metadata or the information um, that can be collected during that process. So starting with a, a donor survey, if if you have the advantage of the opportunity of actually talking to the people who made the stuff or manage, manage the data, um, being able to have that opportunity as a means to, to collect as much information about, about, um, about the, the data itself is gonna put you in a much better place um, for both 
sort of preparing for preservation, but also for description. So even describing the context of those materials. Um, and, and what these categories are, are sort of these, these categories that have individual questions around them. So it's really just a survey instrument. It's a series of questions that I have and that I found through a couple different uses to be um, more applicable when you're actually able to have that sort of face-to-face -face or phone conversation. So rather than just sending someone a bunch of questions that they have to fill out, it's much more of a conversation um, towards getting some of this information. Um, and then sort of taking that, uh, whatever information you can collect, um, perhaps having access to some amount of a sample of the material, so whether you're sort of visiting with someone on the site or you can Sort of grab a certain amount of the actual files themselves um, and, and ultimately doing sort of a feasibility assessment. So what, what are the formats? Um, are we talking about different types of, of media that we haven't worked with before? And ultimately trying to answer this question, so do we have the resources right now um, to acquire, preserve, and provide access to these materials? Um, so in my case, um, we, in, in my time at the university, uh, we had acquired a collection of um, architectural drawings from a, a local architecture firm that had, um, well, they sort of morphed, evolved into something else, but they had donated a certain amount of their historical materials, mostly large architectural drawings um, in map cases, but also a number of um, architectural uh, digital files built in you know, proprietary software called AutoCAD. Um, and so through conversations with the donor, sort of getting a sense of how they manage those materials, sort of the version of the software they've been using, I was, I was able to do sort of an initial amount of, of basic research to, to answer that question. You know, can, should we even take these materials in the door if we're not ultimately going to be able to provide any access? And so through a certain amount of research, I was able to determine a basic sort of preservation strategy that there were some options to export, convert, migrate something from a proprietary software into uh, Adobe PDF so that we could eventually make those materials at least in that form. Um, and there are some other strategies uh, as involved as well. So um, that's just an example of the, the type of process that's likely to occur with any type of new acquisition, uh, any type of new materials that are showing up that are different from what you've dealt with before. Um, there may need to be sort of a, a, a certain amount of investigation to determine if you can even you know, provide access um, in the near term or the long term. So most of the work that I've been doing has been around accessioning, so sort of gaining initial sort of uh, administrative um, basic sort of collection level or accession level um, metadata um, and, and stabilizing getting data off of the existing media and the collection. And so that's what I'm going to sort of map out now the different tools that I'm using. So starting from documenting the media um, and basically using, using a tool um, that's sort of homegrown database just built in Microsoft Access. It's really on the back end just a spreadsheet with sort of a front end that I use to, to sort of both track the, the process um, of, of doing the work of getting data off of those different pieces of media and then the other steps involved, but also um, sort of recording characteristics about that media. And what I mean by that is, you know, is it a floppy disk? Um, do we know what year it came from? Um, are, is, and most importantly, is there any kind of text, any, like information written on the labels that give us some sense of what may actually be on that piece of media? Um, and you know, there's always a the question of is that actually still true, but at least gives you something um, that, that you can sort of map against what the files look like once you're actually able to look at them. Um, and again, sort of tracking the, the, the steps involved as well, um, and whether or not those steps were successful. So not everything is going to work all the time. You may not be able to get, you know, the floppy, the disk itself may be corrupted or damaged to the point of not being able to do anything with it. So at least documenting what happened uh, during the various steps um, that you can 
use later on. So capturing, transferring that data, um, getting it off of whatever form. In this case, um, a lot of what I've been doing is this image. So again, this is sort of coming out of the forensics approach. And uh, very simply, uh, you know, disk imaging being different from just copying the files off of one piece of media to another. So in the, in the disk image, it's sort of this wrapper that captures uh, things about the file system, so how the file was organized, um, files were organized on a piece of media, or in the case of, say, a whole hard drive from the computer, things about the operating system, a lot of technical metadata that will be important um, in the sort of long-term preservation of, of those digital objects. Um, and you know, requires a certain amount of infrastructure, which I referred to. Not the, the mandatory approach as far as copying or transferring data, um, but something that's come to be embraced um, in the digital archives community. Um, but I think we're still sort of in learning uh, best practices and whether where and whether or not it's applicable. I and mean, then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the policy implications of doing that later on um, and how you sort of communicate with donors what actually occurs um, when you're doing that distance. But this is sort of the basic process. So getting that sort of getting the data off and sort of wrapped up this image, exporting the files out and then initially trying to determine is there anything potentially infected in those files where all familiar with computer viruses, you know, it's always fun to think about it as a parallel to something that has like, an, you know, in the analog world, sort of insects infestation or mold or whatever. So something, some sort of basic preservation check, what's going on with these files, um, do we need to sort of segregate anything immediately, and, and virus scan tools are, are, are uh, there's a plethora of them available, um, so anything would sort of work in that regard. <coughs> And so for the tools, this is again sort of different, different, multiple tools may perform a very similar function. And through testing, I used a number. Um, and all of these were at least free, some were open source. Um, the one on the right dealt specifically with uh, getting data off of those sort of old five and a quarter floppy disks. Um, and each, each sort of had us you know, slightly different interface, um, but the basic functions, um, so the act of sort of doing um, led me to, you know, figure out that most of them met my functions, some performed a little better um, than others, and there are always issues um, that occur. And so in this case, one of the issues was, especially with sort of older formats, older pieces of media, the, the way that the files are organized may not be recognized by, by contemporary, um, our contemporary machines, our contemporary operating systems, or even by pieces of software. Um, and that's really important to understanding what the data actually looks like. So if you think about how, how data is stored on whatever type of media, it's really just a bunch of bits, right? It's just a bit stream. It's what we like to call it, a bit stream. Um, and files are really what start to organize the file system organize those for the computer to you know, render that that's a JPEG image or a Word document. Um, so in this case, if, if a file system isn't recognized, it's really sort of more difficult to move beyond just understanding at a bit level, um, or even do the act of, of capturing and transferring that data. Um, so this happened a few times when I was sort of going through the process of dealing with older media, getting data off of it. I documented it in my, my log. Um, and then and then started sort of thinking about, well, what are the other options out there? So if I'm using these tools right now, and here's sort of a limitation of these tools and a limitation related to the, the nature of the media itself, what are some other options? And yes, there are some other options about there. This is a, a tool, sort of a, a hardware um, and accompanying software that basically will read, will sort of look at that older media and read it at a much lower level. So it's really still just capturing the bits, but it at least allows you to do that act of getting, getting that off of that older media and, and getting it sort of wrapped up in some version um, so that you can sort of do the, the, the more investigative work later on. Um, and so this is something that we haven't really um, 
pursued quite yet, but it's it's on the horizon of uh, sort of a next step for those those sort of those materials that we determine had issues with. So that's just an example of you know, here's the tools I'm using. They're working in this way. Here's something else that I might need to use depending on you know the need. So if it's too too floppy to have this issue right now, we may decide that we don't necessarily need to purchase this tool right now. But if we find a bunch of it, so it's sort of that sort of what is your context of that. So moving from, okay, we got the data off of these different different forms of media. We need to do some initial under, analysis of understanding of what's there and you know, some basic basic uh, metadata about um, those files. Um, and in this case, um, the, the, you know, these different functions and different tools to perform, perform those functions. Um, and again, this is sort of just, just preparing it's both preparing for long-term preservation, but also trying to collect some basic information for description, in the case of our archive materials, arrangement and description as well, and also implications for access. Um, so a couple different tools I've been using. Um, so identifying personal information. Um, so even in the case of a collection where say all the rights, all the copyright has been transferred from materials. Um, you know, we may we may want to determine um, if there's some sort of personal information in those materials, so things like copyright or things like uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers, before sort of providing open access on the web. Um, so there's this emerging tool called BitCurator um, that's also sort of taking forensics type tools um, and allowing us to sort of scan across uh, a given set of files and trains to start to identify some of that information. That's what that looks like. Again, sort of simple. Um, and one of the issues I found is that doing these scan provides you some sort of basic high level information um, that you maybe identify things that could be potentially risky to just sort of throw out into the world. Um, but if you're trying to find maybe some like, things that are more in the sort of sensitive or confidential realm, um, it may be a little harder to find, to be able to search and find that material with existing tools. Um, there may be some other tools that are available, or uh, there may be sort of new skills that are needed to do this sort of uh, a more granular search. Um, and um, that's something I'm sort of in a conundrum about right now as far as where to invest my time and thinking about um, if we want to make these materials accessible, what do we need to do as far as sort of our due diligence as part of this? Um, and then I think this is something that's shared across institutions. Um, so I'm sort of in the mode of investigating and thinking about this um, and, and um, haven't come to a firm decision yet. Um, but so just to wrap up with accessioning, what I've tried to do is sort of put that together in a report. So everything that I've learned, the process of transferring materials, um, the types of formats, preservation issues, and then some basic amount of intellectual material, um, try to wrap that up as something I can then pass on to someone who's maybe working with a larger collection that's made up of paper materials as well. Um, and hopefully sort of start to integrate that into the larger process of and so in this case, I think there are some need for tools. Um, so if we're, if as a sort of a community, we've embraced something like um, more product, less processing, um, we're not going to be looking at individual files. So what, what are the tools we need to sort of do high level uh, scanning or analyzing of the content to get some sense of what's there, um, but that's going to that's not going to force us to be opening up individual documents or files. And I think there's a lot of need here um, and that we may need, just as sort of the methods and tools from digital forensics were then adopted, and maybe we can look in other areas as well. And this is sort of a, sort of a next step emerging area as well um, that I think, I think is going to be very needed. Um, I'm going to have to skip through some of this. I'm sort of running out of time. But Access is something we're sort of on the verge of dealing with as well, um, and again, sort of related to sort of a comfort, being comfortable in providing access to materials that may or may not have different levels of restrictions that could come through donor agreements or copyright, or sort of our level of being comfortable with you know, 
providing access to things like email correspondence. Um, so we're sort of working out things in that regard. So moving from sort of testing, um, evaluating towards how do we sustain this program over time. And so what we started from, I started from sort of an initial sort of policy sketch of here's some basic sort of statements around um, the work that we're doing. And through the act of, of testing the workflow or sort of doing the work with the materials we had, I've come to refine those statements and sort of be able to um, provide some transparency both internally and externally. So this is what we do when we get the materials. This is what happens when we transfer them. Um, you know, this is what we do with um, materials, you know, that are going to be disposed or deleted. Um, as a means of being able to communicate both with donors, with people who are giving us materials, and other stakeholders um, in the library, and our, our researchers, people who are going to be coming in and using these materials as well. Documenting as much as possible, so all that documentation um, in something like a log, getting procedures more refined, um, all towards trying to make that something that can live beyond me, right? So I don't have all of the institutional knowledge. And, and that's something that can be sort of translated in this post-digital archivist scenario, um, where maybe we, maybe, I'm curious about how this is gonna evolve, where we might start moving toward, we're all just archivists, we're all just librarians, and we're, you know, digital is, is just what we do, it's just the nature of what we do, and rather than sort of just specialized, and I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, but what I'm trying to do is build out something that I can start to sort of break out into different activities that other, others, particularly in my institution, other staff members or even students can perform. So if if we have sort of, we determine we're gonna use this piece of software right now, here's the sort of steps that you perform to use this, this piece of software to do this task, then I don't see why students can do some of that work. Um, yeah, I mean, we're gonna have sort of issues that are gonna arise, we're gonna discover new issues, and I'm gonna be a part of the process. Um, but trying to get to the point where this work is embedded throughout our, our workflows and it's not this sort of thing that's happening over here that no one knows about. Um, and I think that's sort of key towards um, making things more sustainable um, over time. And at the same time, I'm also leading the efforts for a sort of a library-wide digital preservation program. And that's a huge piece of, of having something that's really sustainable. So if we're getting more digital stuff in, archives and special collections, we're also digitizing, we're getting sort of different types of digital content that's coming into the library. So sort of the comprehensive policy framework and infrastructure. And I think sort of taking a similar iterative approach, what do we have now, what are the needs right now, uh, and moving, moving towards a much more sustainable program all around. So for the future, what I'm, what I'm most excited about is having this foundation, this workflow foundation. Yes, we can accept materials, we can sort of prepare them for preservation, we can start to make them accessible, but we can really start to be much more active sort of in the, the acquisition and the pre-acquisition stages, right? We can start to have conversations with creators about how they're, they're producing materials and how they're managing them um, to get to basically be more involved in that process, more sort of the, the digital curation space um, that, that it's gonna allow us to sort of move beyond um, just just sort of dealing with triage and being much more actively involved, both in our institutions and then generally as sort of archivists, librarians, you know, in the world, in society, sort of our different roles um, that we can start to embrace. Yeah. Questions on the room? Um, I have a couple that came in uh, online. One is kind of general. Where where did you receive your training to be a digital curator? And specifically, what kind of classes did you take? Right, um, so I did my master's in library information science at San Jose State, San Jose State University. Um, and that was sort of in the mid-2000s. Um, you know, I took a couple courses <coughs> on preservation, digital preservation. And I would say that those sparked my interest in, in doing this type of work, um, but it was really through the process of doing a, a thesis research project, really thinking about electronic records and implications and different types of organizations. 
and really it's it's been a, a lot of ongoing learning, right? So it's a lot of knowing that everything is going to continue to change and sort of staying up on um, best practices and standards and using tools. Um, so there, I think a lot of a lot of new types of programs. Um, so I teach in the the SAA DAS certificate program. That's a great program that gives you sort of a course structure to follow to really get introduced to concepts and quickly start doing doing the work of you know learning tools and sort of implementing concepts. Um, so I think from where I was to the opportunities now, there's many more um, to sort of focus on digital curation and digital archives. Um, so I would encourage people to explore those, um, even though those weren't around when I was doing my studies. And one other question that came in um, out of mind, have you had to redact, and if so, what program do you use? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that we have had scenarios where, with collections where redaction um, could have been an option, um, and it still is an option, um, but um, not something that uh, we've sort of tested and or implemented at this point, uh, mostly because uh, we're sort of still trying to determine what access looks like for our institution, and based on sort of the existing platforms we're using for other digital content, you know, we have lots of digitized collections, uh, so we're using certain platforms for that, um, and whether or not sort of the potential restrictions around more digital materials might be appropriate. And so for, for especially for materials that um, may be, or potentially could be applicable for redaction. I know that Big Curator is, um, that was one of the functions they had mapped out as far as something that could be sort of implemented with their, their tool, with their software environment, um, but that, that's not been developed yet. It's not something that's sort of built into the current version of that. Um, and honestly, I haven't explored a lot of other options um, to date. Okay, and we do have a request if you could repeat the three disk imaging tools that you consider. Uh, via the slide? Uh, they don't say specifically, so maybe <laughs> that or to just name them. So the three tools. Um, so FTK Imager was um, a, a sort of a free light version of um, a tool called Forensic Toolkit. Um, and it's sort of a simplified version that only creates a disk image. Um, and that's from a company called Access Tika. Um, Gynager is a, an open source disk imaging tool. Um, it runs on Linux, the Linux operating system. It's built into the BitCurator software environment. Um, and this FC5205 um, is, comes with this piece of hardware um, that connects to a um, five and a quarter floppy disk. Um, so the little chipboard on the side there, and it's basically the sort of USB interface. And it's, it's a very simple interface that comes um, with that, you can, I mean, but you can download that software from their website as well. So if you search FC5205 disk image on the internet, you should be able to find it. Okay, I think that's all the questions. 